Good afternoon, I'm David Sweat, Deputy Director, Shelby County Health Department, and joined once again by Chief Doug McGowan from the City of Memphis. Welcome to the City of Memphis and Shelby County <clears throat> Joint COVID Task Force Press Briefing for April the 29th. When we look into the numbers today, we've had 95,262 cases of COVID-19 disease reported in Shelby County. So far, we've had 7,282 cases reported from Tipton County in Tennessee, 4,973 cases from Fayette County. In DeSoto County, Mississippi, we've had 21,289 cases reported so far. And Crittenden County, Arkansas, 5,625 cases have been reported. For Shelby County, that is an increase of 175 new cases yesterday. And we have remaining at 1,617 people who have died from uh, COVID-19 in the past year. As far as vaccine data and analysis based on what was in the uh, tennis file yesterday from the state, 310,060 people have been vaccinated in Shelby County. That includes 99,731 people who've had a single dose of a two dose series and 210,329 people who have completed a two dose series or have received Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And so they're, therefore they are fully vaccinated. Those numbers bring us to 44% of our vaccine target goal of 700,000 vaccinated individuals in Shelby County and represents 33% of the population having at least one dose. About 23% of the population having two doses and therefore fully vaccinated. Some events that I wanna raise to your attention, <clears throat> we continue to need to test to find uh, what viruses are circulating, but also to help people know their status. And there is going to be another free testing event that we're cooperating with Latino Memphis um, before the Cinco de Mayo Festival that will be held at 6041 Mount Moriah Road, uh, Suite 16 here in Memphis and 3815. That will be on Friday, April 30th from 3 to 5 p.m. It's free of charge. Anybody five years old and older can get tested at that event, know your status. And that's also important for us in detecting what viruses are circulating in the community. You know that we have talked before about the the robust sequencing efforts that we have going on in Shelby County to help us understand the strains and the variants of concern that may be circulating or viruses that pose a public health threat that could be emerging in our community. And so both for an individual's status to know, do I have COVID or not? And for the community's awareness of what's circulating in the community, we continue to need people to come out and be tested. Um, we're also continuing to offer and cooperate with partners to create vaccination events. And at the Cinco de Mayo Festival, the Blue Moon Event Center on Sunday, 2554 Mount Moriah Road, there will be vaccine available from noon to 4.30 p.m. And both Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson vaccines will be available while supplies last at the festival. So if you haven't been vaccinated otherwise and you want to be, that's another opportunity that you can come and do that. As far as some other statements uh, mentioned about the variants and the sequencing and surveillance activities that we have going on. And this week, <clears throat> you, did, you probably have all been aware, it's, it's difficult not to be aware of what's going on in, Indi <clears throat> excuse me, in India right now. And the tremendous surge of cases that they have in India. One of the reasons that that is occurring is emerging variants and mutating viruses in the subcontinent of India. And one of those strains that the World Health Organization has declared a variant of interest is called B1617. That virus has been detected this week in Shelby County. So we, re need, we need to remain vigilant for the arrival of new viruses that could pose a concern to our community because if COVID act, uh, disease is active anywhere in the world, it continues to pose a risk to us here because the entire world is connected today. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chief McGowan to give us an update on the vaccine campaign.
Thank you, David. Very brief report today. As David said, we have, uh, as of this morning, 520,000 vaccines delivered to more than 313,000 individuals, and we have more than 213 people, 213,000 people that are fully vaccinated. That's a that's pretty good numbers, but as David said, we're not quite to our goal where we want to be. Uh, but we have seen a bit of an uptick this week in people taking advantage of the vaccines, and that is good news. Uh, talking a little bit about next week, uh, we are going to maintain the capacity that we have. We're going to maintain all of the fixed sites that we have um, operating right now. That's the Pipkin Building, the Faith Baptist site out on North Germantown Parkway, the Raleigh at the Greater Amani. Uh, church down at Whitehaven at Southwest Tennessee Community College, uh, Germantown and Collierville Pod out at uh, Germantown Baptist, uh, and the Gill Campus in the Fraser Community, which is located on Mountain Terrace Road. All of those sites will be open. Uh, the schedules for those sites will be published this afternoon. Many of them will have no uh, need to have an appointment because they will be open all day, and all you need to do is show up. Others will have appointments available, typically in the morning, so you can take advantage of those appointments. Uh, there are two changes to next week. Um, the first is that uh, there will not be uh, vaccinations this Sunday at the Pipkin Building, uh, just due to demand, which is very, very low on the weekend, so uh, we won't be having any Sunday vaccinations at the Pipkin Building. Uh, and then the question that we had earlier this week was about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, we will continue to administer that uh, at individuals' uh, discretion at homebound and homeless events. And then uh, we are establishing a new walk-in clinic next week um, at Jackson Avenue, the old Northgate Shopping. Well, it's actually the Northgate Shopping Center. There is a building there that was once occupied by the state of Tennessee. The address is 3230 Jackson Avenue. Uh, it will be listed on our scheduling software on the website as the Jackson Avenue site. It will operate Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, this is going to be different than the drive through sites. Uh, this is a walk-in site. No appointment will be necessary during the hours of 9 to 6, Monday to Friday. You simply drive to the site, park your car, walk in the building, and uh, you'll be able to receive the J&J &J vaccine. So that will be available to everyone, no matter where you live. Uh, you can come to the Jackson Avenue site and receive Johnson & Johnson if that's what you would like. We'll start on Monday with about 300 doses and we'll amp that up as demand drives. Uh, or as, demand, as we see the demand, we will drive up the amount of allocation that we have at that site. But that's where we'll start next week. So look for the schedule coming out uh, later this afternoon a new opportunity for people who want Johnson & Johnson, still robust capacity for vaccines. Uh, and uh, with that, I will conclude my comments and turn it over to you for any questions you might have. Sam Hardiman, Commercial Appeal. Hi. Um, Doug, my first question is for you, and maybe you just clar could clarify this a little bit. If mm. Pipkin is not doing Sunday, um, and you said it's the same capacity. Are those still 21,000 shots still available, just kind of, you know, yeah. over a different time period? And then what's the daily capacity of Jackson Ave? Sorry if I missed that. Okay, so it's a good question, Sam. Um, we have uh, the, at the community vaccination site, the capacity is uh, 3,000 a day with 21,000 doses. That's what the staffed capacity is. Uh, we've actually done an evaluation of our throughput, and it's actually significantly higher than 3,000 a day. Uh, we can actually put through at the Pipkin site more than 4,000 a day. So because we will not be vaccinating on Sunday, uh, we will still be staffed, and we would be able to accommodate fully 3,500 a day through the Pipkin site if we were to get that kind of volume. So there's no drop-off in capacity. We still have access to the same amount of vaccine um, the federal support that we are getting is following the model that we want to put into place. And so that's what we've chosen to do. Uh, just as a conservation of manpower, we were really getting very little return on Sundays there. So uh, we will retain capacity to do the full 21,000 a week at Pipkin Building, uh, but we'll just do that over a six-day-a-week period. 
Um, and your second question was about the J&J &J capacity. We're starting with 300 doses a day uh, at the walk-in clinic there on 3230 Jackson Avenue. But uh, should that demand uh, far exceed that, we will, uh, we will match that demand uh, with vaccines. So we can go up as high as we need to there. Uh, but that's where we're going to start. And that's just the beginning. If we see a significantly high demand, we would also uh, move to offer that at other pods throughout the community. But uh, we're just starting with the one walk-in site. And as a follow-up, um, Dr. Sweat, um, how many cases of B1617 um, have been found in Shelby County thus far? Thank you, Sam, for the question. Uh, so far, it's one. It's a travel-associated case, individual who returned after visiting India and came back and developed symptoms after returning, so was incubating the virus um, during their flight and has, has been detected this week uh, here through testing. So it's one person, and we've been working to uh, isolate and quarant test contacts and you know, quarantine those as well. Fred Broders, Local 24. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I guess this question would be for Dr. Sweat or Chief McGowan. Uh, just uh, any updates uh, on the potential uh, mask mandate lifted and restrictions? I know it was pretty fresh on Tuesday. Any updates regarding that? And I have a follow-up. Sure. Um, so as far as, as that, I mean, what you're really talking about is the health directive. And as you all know, we update the health directive uh, about every two to four weeks, depending and the next health directive is in the process of being written. I don't have the exact language and wording of what that's going to say yet because it's still under development. So we expect to be able to tell you next week what that's going to say, but certainly um, any tweaks or adjustments to anything in the health directive will come out with that next version, including any adjustments that might be made to the mask, um, masking requirements in Shelby County. And as a follow-up, does other metro counties lifting their mandates, does that have any factor in what you all are considering? And I know this was discussed on Tuesday. Is there any possibility that the city and the suburbs could be under different rules in the next directive? Uh, well, there's several <coughs> hypothetical questions in there, Brad. But I, let me just say this, if I could give a statement that tries to address the variety of um, concerns that, that people have had about this uh, development this week. First, the, the mission, vision, and values of the Shelby County Health Department have always been and remain to protect the health and safety of everybody in Shelby County to the greatest extent that we can do it. As far as our partnership with the state, one of the things that I know it's, uh, it's somewhat attractive and simple to want to pr promote the idea that we're in conflict. But the truth is we've been partners with the state for over a year now in this response. And the state has been really integral to everything we do. We have a lot of conversations with them, both from the city and from the county, to try to coordinate our efforts. And we are actually all trying to get all of our citizens in Tennessee safely through this pandemic. So we don't really consider ourselves to be adversaries. We consider ourselves to be partners. And that includes with the governor's office and the Tennessee Department of Health. What we uh, want to say as far as um, our stance and our mission and, and our perspective on how we go about doing the work we do to protect people in Shelby County is we want to recognize that the, the virus knows no boundaries, knows no borders. Variants and um, emerging threats could come to us from anywhere in the world at any point in time. So it's important for all of us here to remain vigilant and to follow the best public health guidance and recommendations that we can to protect ourselves and our loved ones and our community. And the health department does recommend that people continue to do things that we have said for a year now. We recommend that you continue to practice social distancing, that we not gather closely together, packed together in groups, that we wash our hands and use hand sanitizer frequently because good hand hygiene 
is an important piece to stopping the way that viruses can spread from one person to the next. Also, respiratory etiquette. And so, you know, wearing a mask is a protective measure that all of us can do to protect ourselves from other people's viruses and to prevent us from inadvertently infecting somebody with a virus that we may be shedding that we don't understand we are because we're not feeling the symptoms yet. So we continue to recommend all of these measures. Those are the things we've been pushing or recommending for the past year. And now we have an additional ultra important tool that we didn't have a year ago and that's the vaccine. So all of these vi variant viruses seem to be, uh, the, the vaccine protects against the worst outcomes from all of these viruses. In other words, what I'm saying, if an emerging threat virus happens and you're vaccinated and you expo or get exposed or infected with that virus, it's still very, very likely that your body's immune system can fight that because it's been charged up and that it, you're much less likely to die much less likely to wind up with severe disease in the hospital. And uh, with many of the variants, the vaccine is completely protective. You're not even likely to experience symptoms of illness at all. But it doesn't work if you don't take it. It only works for those who receive the shot. So in terms of uh, what other people do or don't do or recommend or don't recommend or require or don't require, as far as Shelby County is concerned, we're gonna push, uh, recommend people do the best thing to protect themselves in the community, um, and, and we'll continue to do that. Kelly Roberts, WMC. Good afternoon. Um, my first question is about the numbers and the indicators that we're seeing right now. I'm wondering, um, when we look at the numbers, for example, the daily case rate over the last seven days, it looks like the average number has gone down compared to previous weeks. I know that the last reproduction rate though is still over one. And I know we've been saying for a while now that you know the eyes are on these um, cases to see where they go, whether they spike or if it's temporary or um, kind of a fluke. So I'm wondering if we could have any kind of definitive statement when it comes to what the numbers look like now do we feel like we have skirted any kind of fourth wave or what is there to determine now? Yeah, I think that's way too early to tell. What I can say is that we had a higher rise right after Easter and that it came down a little bit, but we've seen that go back up. Um, we're, our case rate per 100,000 right now is about 16 cases per 100,000 over the last seven days. We're averaging about 150 cases a day, although we had 175 reported today, or yesterday. So we'll be watching to see what our numbers look like today. But what, when you look at it, it's, you know, an analogy I might have is a false flat. I'm a cyclist. And so when you're riding, sometimes the road looks flat, but you can feel it in your legs. It's not exactly flat, it's still going up. And that's kind of where we're at. It looks flat, or it kind of looks flat a little bit, but really there is a slight increase in cases because the reproductive rate of the virus is above one. So we're continuing to grow, and we had 175 reported yesterday. So um, still watching the data. I guess that's the easiest way I could say it. Thank you. And my second question is, is about vaccines. Uh, Chief McGowan, you did mention that you guys are seeing um, a slight uptick in vaccine uptake this week. Any idea on, you know, percentage-wise or numbers-wise, any hard numbers you could give us on what that uptake looks like? Sure. How many people are, are looking for that vaccine this week? Yeah, it's, uh, there's still, uh, there was not enough uptake for anybody to worry about not being able to get an appointment it was a perceptible rise where we had been doing in the high hundreds. Uh, I'll use the Pipkin as an example, as we've been doing the high hundreds uh, every day, nearly a thousand. We were over a thousand for several days this week. So uh, we're seeing that at all of the sites, you know, uh, a perceptible rise, but not one that would impact our ability to deliver in any case, and certainly not near our maximum capacity. So um, it was a small percentage rise, but a rise nonetheless, and I'll take wins when I can get them. I do want to make one correction. Um, Sam asked the question about the number of J&J &J at our Jackson Avenue site. I said 300. The actual number is 500. 
uh, chalk it up to old eyes looking at my notes, but it's 500 uh, at the Jackson site for J&J. &J. And if demand increases, we will obviously increase the number of doses we provide there. So uh, sorry for misspeaking there earlier. Mandy Rock, Fox 13. Hi, good afternoon. I'm wondering how big of an issue it is to get the vaccine to people who may be working multiple jobs and don't have time to get the shot at the fixed sites during the hours they're open and sure. what steps are being taken just to make sure that it's accept accessible to those people. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a really good one, Mandy. We had a meeting this morning talking about shifting some days and hours and at least, and at least one, if not several of our sites, will have some extended hours next week. Uh, so we'll look at extending, you know, maybe starting a little later in the day at a site and then ending later in the day and see if we can get some uptick there in uh, those vaccines. So uh, we are looking at extending some of the hours so we can catch folks at night. We did that the other way early on. We uh, moved to early in the morning um, for folks to catch them as they're coming off the night shift or getting ready to go into the early shift in the morning. So. Uh, we are looking at that and you should expect to see uh, at least one of the sites with some extended hours uh, to catch folks in the evening. Awesome, thank you. And I just have one more question. I'm wondering if there's any concern people are skipping the second shot in the two shot series because they're afraid of the potential side effects. And just what would you want to tell those people who may be afraid to get that? Because sure. they right. hear that the side effects are worse with the second. You know, I saw some of the, uh, I saw some of the, uh, articles that said people may have been skipping their second dose for whatever reason. Um, you know, I, I would just suggest that the symptoms of the, if you have any symptoms uh, from the second uh, vaccine, they are much less severe than the COVID disease itself. Um, I, I can use my personal experience. I had the second dose of Pfizer. Um, my experience was incredibly mild. I had uh, a slight headache for a few hours the next morning, but that was it. Uh, and it certainly was not like a normal headache you might get uh, from working at City Hall or doing a response to uh, COVID. So it was nothing like that. Um, and so I would encourage people to go there. I do know people had different experience uh, with Moderna potentially as a slightly more significant, but um, I would encourage people to, you made the investment in the first, let's go get the second and, and uh, get across the finish line because uh, you do have an increased level of protection. So. Uh, it's it's really not that bad. Shay Arthur, WREG. Hi there. I hope you guys are having a great afternoon. Uh, question for Mr. Sweat. We've gotten some information uh, that slowly hospitalizations for COVID symptoms are starting to rise. And a lot of these cases are in younger people. Um, can you talk a little bit about this? People in the ICU and is this concerning? Right. Uh, so that is one of the things that we are looking at. Of course, we monitor that closely have throughout. Um, I haven't seen today's data, but looking at the data yesterday, about 18 or between 18 and 20 percent of the beds in the intensive care units were occupied by patients with COVID disease. And we do see, particularly in the ICU beds, we do see and project going forward that there will be an increase, continue to increase the number of cases that are hospitalized and in the ICU. Anecdotally, uh, from talking with some of the infectious disease physicians in town about the kinds of experience they're having treating patients now compared to say a year ago. Um, a year ago, the, the patients that were likely to be hospitalized with COVID disease were older and they are somewhat younger now. So we're, we're seeing people hospitalized who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, whereas before a, a greater preponderance of people were in their 50s, 60s, 70s in the hospital. So there has been sort of a shift down, but that's not, I don't have hard data about that. That's just the anecdotal experience that an infectious disease physician shared with me this week of the kind of patients that, that he's treating. And a couple of things about that, though, that could have an impact on our intensive care unit beds particularly. In the previous experience a year ago with older patients that were more frail, had a higher number of comorbidities, um, a lot of them died in the hospital in the intensive care unit fairly quickly uh, during their disease course. And <clears throat> that's unfortunate and tragic. 
what we're seeing with a lot of these younger patients is that they're more resilient physically, their bodies are fighting harder, and they're often experiencing longer hospitalizations, staying in the intensive care unit for many weeks. And so where that could potentially impact is that the ICU could become filled with patients and those patients would stay there for a longer period of time. Gotcha. Uh, and just circling back to my follow up, circling back to that variant you, you talked about at the beginning. I know there was only one case, uh, it was travel associated, but you know, we have seen a lot of variants start to pop up here in our area. Uh, what's just your message again, just as I mean, this likely probably won't be the only case as we look down the road, we hope it is, a, it might not be as the importance of, you know, vaccination and protecting yourself. Right. So I think there's a couple of things there. Uh, I know that Memphis is special. We're special. We always are. And of course, sometimes we feel like it's, um, you know, Memphis versus everybody. But the truth is we're a microcosm of the world. And so we are detecting these variants because our surveillance capability is more capable, more designed, more robust to find them. Probably what we're seeing in our community is also happening in other parts of the United States in, in counties of a similar size. So everywhere you have 900 to 900,000 to a million people, you're probably getting multiple introductions of multiple different variant viruses. So what's different in Memphis? What's different in Memphis is that 10% or more of the people who get COVID disease are having their samples sequenced and we know which virus they have. And so in, in many ways, that's a, a blessing. And I think we need to review it that way. We have a wonderful collaboration between our laboratories, our research university here at uh, University of Tennessee Health Science Center and the health department to surveil for these things. And not every community benefits from that. But what it also runs the risk of being, oh yeah, one more variant coming out of Memphis, right? You know, people could, we could get that reputation. But I think for the citizens, what I would say is, uh, let's be grateful for this, the capabilities we have and we'll use them to the best of our ability to isolate any dangerous variants as quickly as possible to protect the community. Omir Youssef, Daily Memphian. Hi, uh, my first question is, obviously you try lots of different things to try and get people to come out to get vaccinated. Just what are some of the things that you all have learned that haven't worked to this point? I'm gonna let Chief McGowan take the first stab at that. Uh, thanks. It's a good question. I don't know that there's a pat answer or a definitive science behind it, but I think uh, I don't know that there's anything that hasn't worked. Um, all of the attempts that we have had through communications channels, I think one-on-one -on -one dialogue with people who they trust, that works. Uh, there were people when we had gift cards, they came. Uh, that, that got them over the hump, whether they were going to get the vaccine or not. I think it provided some urgency so they could come out. That worked. Um, we've had some messaging uh, to groups and groups have come together. I think that worked. Uh, the question is not whether any one of them worked because I think they all have had some effect. Uh, the question is the scale of the effect. And so we're going to continue to look at opportunities uh, to try to drive some participation in vaccine for those who are hesitant. I fully understand that there are um, uh, there's a segment of the population who absolutely will not get vaccinated under every circum any circumstance. And uh, certainly we're not trying to win them over because I know there's no winning them over. But what we are trying to do is for people who, uh, you know, more than 50% of the people have said, sure, I'll get a vaccine. Uh, I just, you know, it's a question of when I go get it. Uh, I'm trying to encourage uh, many more folks to come and get vaccinated since we have this capacity now. Um, and uh, time's a waste and let's come and get your vaccine. So we'll continue to try uh, a number of things to get folks out to get vaccine, their vaccination. Was there a follow up? Follow up. Uh, yes, uh, this is for Doug. So what would you say is the long term future of those mass vaccination sites? Well, again, I, long is a relative term as well. So uh, clearly, uh, we're going to balance demand that we see with the amount of uh, effort that's being put in because it is a significant effort underway. 
Um, funding is not an issue, but manpower is. As you know, we are doing, we don't have anything that approaches in this community a mass vaccination team. Uh, this is a collaborative effort between a number of partners who are all coming together to deliver this. And so um, there is, uh, as we forecast at the beginning of this, there is likely a time when mass vaccination sites are not the prime delivery vehicle, but community clinics, uh, hospital systems, uh, eventually, you know, primary care doctor's offices will be a uh, primary delivery vehicle, as will what we're seeing today, Walgreens, Walmart, CVS, all of the pharmacies where people get their flu shots. So I think the horizon is, you know, it's visible on the horizon, the end of the mass vaccination sites, or at least in the numbers that we have. And I think that we'll all, we will continue as long as this pandemic is before us to offer some uh, ability for public vaccination. And uh, while I am not an expert in public health, as you know, our health department does offer that capacity for people who don't have access to other vaccines uh, for a number of other diseases. So there's always gonna be some public capacity. I think having this number and at this scale, uh, we can see the horizon where that's gonna be coming down. Any closing messages today? Uh, certainly, we encourage folks to come on out and take advantage of the vaccine. As David said, uh, we encourage folks to continue to wear masks and do the right thing, make the right personal choices. Uh, there is still testing available, so uh, you know, take advantage of the testing. It's free and it's convenient as well. Um, we are hopeful that the numbers, though they are flat, will continue to come down and vaccines are the way out of this pandemic. So. Uh, we appreciate everyone, uh, their continued compliance and support. Uh, the reason that we haven't had more deaths in this community and more hospitalizations is because of the collective effort of this community. And we are appreciative of that. And we understand the sacrifices both individually and collectively that we've made. So uh, let's continue the next five weeks, uh, really push hard this month of May uh, to get vaccines while we still have uh, significantly large capacity to do so. Thanks everyone, we'll be back next week.